to the EEPROM 9. So now we finally get to my Acorn Electron review. Of course here you've got three units demonstrated in front of you and I've got a little torch for extra light. Nice LED. So we have ourselves with the Acorn Electron. My personal favourite ATIS computer although today was filled with conjunction as I forgot the keys when coming back to work and I couldn't get in my attempts to break into my own house failed trying to unhook the keys off the hook with guards and support posts well the keys ended up falling on the floor to where I couldn't get them and the only open window upstairs well I'm not exactly monkey man so I couldn't climb up to it but that's a whole different story for a different time. Yeah, I'm not a monkey man, I can't climb. So the Acorn Electron was released in late 1990, no not 1990, 1983 to run up competing to Christmas because Acorn wanted to compete with the Spectrum on their games market and take a slice of that success. So this is what they did. They brought out a machine which was vastly cost reduced and a lot simpler because of it. I mean it has a beautiful profile, it's nice and small. Now I'll take this over for static reasons but you'd have your expansion port for adding on things like plus ones and that on the back. Your RF your composite video which outputs in monochrome your RGB and your cassette interface and then of course your power input the only other method of input is the keyboard which is definitely one of the or if not the best keyboards I've ever used it is lovely now sadly due to manufacturing problems of the ULA's by Ferenti which a uh, UK company that invented the ULA and of course went on to develop and of course well the invention of the ULA went on to develop the FPGAs and other custom logic chips you see in today's modern appliances absolutely everywhere one well, external profile of Pimple so that manufacturing setback hit a dent that they couldn't fully recover from. However, they did manage to get it up to the peak, the third best-selling comp home computer of the 1980s, getting in league with the Commodore 64, but never overtaking it. One thing that the Electron surpasses the 64 on is the ability to use any cassette player, this particular model is the 1970s cassette player that I've hacked motor control into. This means, well, cheap, easy to obtain peripherals and you can adjust the level on them which is a real disadvantage with the Commodore because you can't do things like that. You're stuck with only Commodore. It's a real shame because it does put a downer. The Commodore, when it comes to loading off cassette, is really quite crap and finicky. While a great machine, it's a pain in the arse on cassette tape. Because it was really designed for the US market, not for the UK. The machine has a built in basic assembler for programming and a assembly language assembler for the 6502 assembly language which can then be used to program an assembly but also it's able to error check its own programs which gives it a distinct advantage of helping you diagnose errors in both basic and assembly Now the machine has, I'm going to have to refer to oldcomputers.com for all the specs because I cannot memorise all the specs for so many computers. Uh, 
6502 CPU running at 2 mhz for access of the ROM and 1 mhz for access of the RAM. 64, no, 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 32 kilobytes of RAM and ROM. Some people call it a 64K machine. They are wrong because there's only 64K. 32K of system random access memory. Read only memory is the same, which is where the programs hold. Earlier models had two ROM chips. It has custom ULA by Forente. I don't know the part number because I don't have it up on my computer. Uh, its graphics modes for text were 20 by 32, 40 by 25, 40 by 32. 80 by 25, 80 by 32, and it could also do in graphic modes as 160 times 256, 4 or 16 colours, 320 by 256, 2 or 4 colours, and 640 by 256, which would be monochrome 2 colours. Now it only has one channel of sound and a channel of white noise. I do not understand any of this audio crap. Seven octaves, three virtual sound channels mapped to a single available physical channel. Built-in speaker, which doesn't have any kind of volume control or anything like that to make it nice on the air. Uh, size weight isn't important, and of course you've got your tape input it has a 19 volt AC PSU, but in reality these PSUs output a bit, quite a bit more voltage in there, and originally sold for £199, but had to be reduced very quickly. Now while it has a really quite weird ding connector for the cassette, which can be seen here, you could get it with a variety of ends for various other cassette players ranging from all markets it also had a unique feature of the time featuring a caps lock LED which isn't on the 64, there was only power LEDs and also as an interesting note I would like to thank UK Retro Games, who's recently found my channel, for telling me that uh, shorting out the LK4 jumper will cause the monochrome video out to output in colour, which is perfect and saves a whole lot of hacking actually. So I say thank you to you for that. You for that, you certainly lives up to his name of helping people out. Now I think I'm going to change the SD card before I go to labelling all what the chips and that are and going more into the techie stuff so bear with me. Me. Also there is 500 known games produced for it all on cassette and a lot more expected. In fact, it was a sex 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 oh god I can't say successful successful enough machine that games are being produced right into the early 90s. And there is still a fan base behind this machine, although not as established as a BBC or anything like that or Commodore 64. So I will change the card and then we get down to what the hardware is. What are all these little things soldered to the boards, you may ask. And what do they do? I might go more technical than most people do, so bear with me. We shall see how it turns out. Part 1. OK, SD card changed nice and empty so I can continue with part two done.
So if you look, there are some noticeable differences between the older and newer. This is an older, earlier 84 model. Hang on, let me just adjust the tripod. And this is a newer release, same with that one. In fact, I think this is a newer release than that one. I haven't compared the date codes on the chips between the two. So how do you identify the older ones to the new ones? Well, first thing, I'll get the light for this, is you will notice that... Oh, God, that makes... Oh, God, that does not do any justice. You'll notice that these key commands, printed on the keys for basic commands, are a sort of dark brownish colour on the newer edition, whereas on the older edition they're more of a bright orange colour. Another difference is when you look in here, I will need the torch for this, you will notice that there's white along the edge top of the PCB up here. The newer model, once again, does not have this and it's all fully green as you can see quite clearly there on the camera. Now, the build quality has to be the absolute best of home computers of the period, often resulting in the containing the best calibre of PCB that you can get of the full fibreglass double-edged thing. I don't know the specifics of PCB manufacturing. Other than that, they're the only two subtle differences I've noticed between them that only an eagle eye will pick up. I also seem to have typed some random gibberish on the screen of the other one when holding it up, so we we'll delete that. Come on, don't be an arse. I'm praising you here, Electron. So this is where we come to the technical overview. The only real cheap, shoddy bit I'd say on the Electron is this. The keyboard connector is all plasticky, but actually when you look at it deeper, it's not too bad. It's got a lovely keyboard PCB. Beautifully well built, strong, sturdy ABS. And then internally, you can see, I mean, if you want to see pictures of inside the older model to compare it with the newer model, this, uh, go to my website. The imagery is up there from where I repaired it. You can even see a picture of the ceramic ULA. I'm not a big fan of black blob chips because they remind me of cheap and nasty often in calculators, unless you go to 70s ones. Now here is your switch mode power supply. Big ass filter cap up here. You've got various smaller ones, transistors, switch mode controller, miniature transformers, and then all output to the motherboard. A 5 volt positive at the top, on the top pin, and on the bottom no, 5 volt negative on the top pin, bottom pins are 5 volt negative, and then what electronic engineers are called common ground, basically negative. It doesn't link to the ground at all. Now, because of the awkwardness of holding a torch while holding this up, these four chips are your RAM. So we've got 8 kilobytes each because if you add them together 16 16 add 16 16 together you'll get 32 up here you have your ROM on older models like the one I've got down there you actually have a point where the ROM socket will go ROM will go and on the very first you have a second ROM here is your 6502 MOS technology e no, CPU. Then you have your custom Ferenti ULA. This is the sold of Black Blob variety. This particular ULA is dead as a dodo. This is your 19 volts AC over to the motherboard to power expansions, which actually links to the connector. 
This chip, because I am actually sad enough to remember what part codes are, I do not know. This one is an inverting buffer. Basically, it's full of several NOT gates. This one is full of four NAND gates. This one has two flip-flops in and that is the same as that, so that will have two flip-flops in. This one I do not know, or that one. This is your four NAND gates here and here. This LM324 is a f quad amplifier chip, so it has four amplifiers built in. Up here you have another NOT gate chip, which has about, I think it's four NOT gates, it, actually it might, yeah, I think it's four, can't remember exactly. This one is, once again, another NOT gate chip, and that controls the clock oscillator here, and I think the one for the video output. You've got your usual little buzzy speaker here, which is 16 ohms, which is quite high for a speaker. You've got various discrete resistors, capacitors and that. You've got your relay for your or, or tape motor control, which on the older one is down here instead of up here. God knows why they revised it. This particular motherboard is an issue Six. The one I've got down there is an issue two. And that's pretty much all the main stuff. Now as I said, UK Retro Game said if you short out that LK4, you can turn your monochrome composite into colour composite. So I thank him for telling me that, and I shall solder that up and test it out. It would be quite nice to have colour instead of crappy monochrome. It would save a whole lot of hacking, too. And that is your Electron motherboard. There's loads of amplification transistors and other stuff, but would really take more than what this SD card can handle to explain. But that is your basic architecture. So the Acorn Electron came out with loads of games didn't hit the huge success in the 80s, but it's a fantastic computer. I would highly recommend it to anyone who wants it. It is awesome. It's also not expensive. You can pick them up for dirt cheap on eBay. I'll put a link up to where, you're, where I got one of them that's still doing them so if you want you don't get the power supply or anything with it so but if you want a secondary one backup or something it would be perfect or one to hack into something it's there um i will uh i might put a few other links down and also another note i've noticed people don't always read the descriptions that i have on my videos I would suggest you do because I quite often use them as a point to put in information I forgot to put in in the video and other additional information, the odd links and that. I don't do a generic information that's the same for every video, they're all different dedicated to the video. So yes, I believe I've fitted in everything I want to say there. This is another one of the long ones but you can't do a short review, you just can't. The Acorn Electron. Highly recommended. Get one. Don't care where you are in the world. Get one. UK sellers do sell them, post them outside the UK. And why, P and why eBay calls postage shipping even over land, God only knows. I don't understand it. If it's going over low land, it's posting. It's only shipping if it goes on a boat and sails across the sea. 
shipping is not putting it in a plane and it flies over the sea. It's putting it in a boat that sails on the sea. And submarines could count as shipping, but I don't believe they use them. It'd be quite cool if they did. Just torpedo everything out the way. <laughs> Drugs traffickers are building their own top submarines, though. <laughs> It's quite fascinating the lengths drug dealers go to. Anyway, thanks for watching. Get an Electron. You need it. And there's plenty of decent games for them. For example, Elite. I must get myself a copy of that. Thanks for watching. And have a wonderful evening. Because this is going to take be a bitch to up edit and upload. See ya when I see ya, my loyal, faithful subscribers. And yeah, let's just let the memory run out. It's easier <laughs> than pressing a button. Pressing a button takes effort.